right, let's take our Bibles this evening and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, please. Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you do not have a Bible, one is provided for you in the pew in front of you, and you're welcome to use that tonight. One of the best gifts that was ever given to our church are those pew Bibles, and I thank the Lord for for it. Years ago, there was a family that said they wanted to buy pew Bibles for our church, and they did. And uh, those Kriegel Bibles that are there are some of the best I've ever seen, that's for sure. To our online family, I want to thank each of you for joining us tonight. God bless each of you. Appreciate it so much. What a harrowing day this has been, and I'm glad you've chosen to be with us this evening. You, uh, if you would like, let me invite you to click your share button, and maybe you can share this on your timeline so folks can listen in as well. To our church family, I want to say thank each of you for being here. God bless you. I appreciate your faithfulness here in the middle of the week, and it means a great deal. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. We'll read together on verse 1, and then you read with me every other verse down through verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I commanded thee, uh, thou and thy sons, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, and the Lord thy God of the fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Pardon my poor reading tonight. The page just almost disappeared from me. And, uh, and it was hard for me to focus on those little tiny black words. But that's all right. What point is that, Brother Darrell? Are they... Twelve minds, not twelve. I think ten or nine, something like that. Heavenly Father, teach us, please, from your precious word. The Bible can clear up a lot of false doctrine if we'll just allow it to do so. So teach us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Brother Dale, I'm going to need you just for a moment, if I may. Uh, How many of you uh, would like another copy or your first copy of what I handed out last week? on the different versions of the Bible. You're going to need one of these. Make sure everybody gets one. And we're going to refer to part of this tonight, so I wanted to make sure everybody had one that did not get one. Or maybe you'd like to have one for tonight because you left yours at home, and you're, you're welcome to it. All righty. I printed up enough for everybody to have one. Now, we're not going to go over that right now, but we are going to refer to it in just a little. Brother Dale, right up this way, sir. And uh, it'll take care of it. There you go. Jason, good to have you here tonight, sir. That's great. Change in your schedule, Brother Penn's schedule. You just get everybody here at once. That just blesses my heart. Now, uh, I want you to listen to me and not look at that right now. And uh, we're going to refer to one part of it uh, tonight. And I think you'll appreciate that. Last week, uh, we took the Word of God and, uh, uh, and we learned what we believe about the Word of God. And it is very important what you believe about this book. It really is. Everything you believe about this book, because D.L. Moody said it right. Either the, this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. And if you don't have a trustworthy Bible, then you're not going to have a trustworthy life. And so, therefore, we need a trustworthy Bible. And last week's Bible study was fairly extensive, and uh, I'm glad that we were able to have it together. Now, this week, we're going to look at what we believe about the Trinity. Uh, The doctrinal statement of our church says this, We believe in one God, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equal in essence, 
while distinct in personality and function. That is in our, that is in our doctrinal statement of our church. And of course, before you ever became a member here, you read that and you were to agree with that, of course, because that's what we believe. And even though it is clearly taught in the Bible, there are many who reject the teaching, the clear teaching of the Word of God concerning the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, for a person to glibly say that the Bible does not mention the triunity of God is ignorance in its purest sense of the word. I remember a man said to me a while back, a number of years ago, in fact, he said, Trinity, he said, that doctrine didn't show up until the 17th century. And I thought, oh goodness, this man didn't even read Genesis chapter 1 and read the fourth word in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. And I'll explain to you why that's significant in the teaching of the Trinity. I think about this, for example, oneness Pentecostals. They declare that the Godhead consists of only one person and deny categorically the doctrine of the Trinity. They maintain that the only real person in the Godhead is Jesus. Thus, they are often referred to as the Jesus-only movement. And I decided to get this from their beliefs and not simply say it, but read it from their doctrine. They maintain that God exists in two modes, as the Father in heaven and as Jesus the Son on earth. Nevertheless, they are the same person, not two separate persons. The Holy Spirit is not regarded as a person at all, merely a manifestation of Jesus' power or a synonym for him. And that is doctrine that is accepted across the oneness Pentecostal movement. It is false doctrine. It is heresy with a capital H. The Bible teaches very clearly that our God is a triune God. When I think about that, so just what does the Bible say about the Trinity? Does it have anything specific to say? And where does the doctrine of the Trinity come from in the Word of God? Is it something that independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, striped-legged, stump-jumping, independent, fundamental, bad-attitude Baptist made up? Or is it actually something that is found in the Word of God? Is it clearly taught? And so um, we're going to understand this about the, uh, the, about the nature of God, at the God that we serve. Number one, if you're taking notes, you're going to write this down. Number one, God is a unity. God is a unity. The Bible says, and I'm going to give you a number of scriptures on this, Psalm 86 and verse 10, for thou art great and doest wondrous things, thou art God alone. And then we have Isaiah 43 verses 10 and 11, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 44, verses 6 and 8, the word of God says, Thus saith the Lord God, the Lord, the King of Israel, uh, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Verse 8 says, In there is there a God besides me? Uh, yea, there is no God, I know not any. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 5 and 6. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, then thou hast not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. And then Mark chapter 12 and verse 29, the word of God says, and Jesus answered him, the first of the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. First Corinthians chapter eight and verse four, as concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, uh, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, 
and of course Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 where we started tonight where the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now oneness Pentecostalism might take verses like that and all it takes is a little bit of study to understand what God is saying. In the Hebrew language of the Bible, it has two different words for the word one. You're going to want to remember this. The first is singular and the other is collective, like one bushel of apples or one bunch of bananas. The word for one in Deuteronomy 6.4 is not the singular one, but the one that is a collective. And even in his unity, we begin to get a glimpse of his trinity. In other words, when the word of God says he is one God, he is one Lord, it says here he is a collective. Now, I challenge anyone to study what I have studied from any source you care to study from, and you will understand that there is a collective and a singular form of the word one, and then you can understand that the Hebrew language gives us the collective one for that. Number two, I said number one, God is a unity. Secondly, God is a trinity. Now, uh, God is one in his essential being, but he exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Old Testament, by the way, declares the Trinity. In the plural name for God, I want you to take your Bible and go very quickly to Genesis chapter 1. I said a while ago that the individual who told me years ago that the Trinity was a false doctrine that was uh, declared in the 1700s, I said, to my, I said to you, he didn't read his Bible. All he had to do was read Genesis chapter 1 and do a little bit of study. Now, sometimes a little bit of study is damaging, but sometimes a little bit of study can take the truth and, and show you what the truth is. And I want you to look what it says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word God is there is the Hebrew word Elohim. Elohim, and it's spelled E-L-O-H-I-M. And uh, in the Hebrew language of the Bible, the word is called a compound unity. Remember that, a compound unity. And what is that? A singular noun with a plural ending. The little I-M ending on Elohim is a plural ending. And so, therefore, in the plural forms of the personal pronouns of God, very, very interesting. In other words, he's referred to in the plurality, not in the singular. The Bible, for example, in Genesis 1 and verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image. Now, I read a false teaching a while back where they said that God was speaking in royal language. How a king <coughs> would say, uh, let us dispense with this trouble. Let us do such and such. And they said that that was royal language that God used. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's a false teaching straight from the pit of hell. God said, let us make man in our image. He was speaking of his plurality. Uh, and the Bible says in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 7, go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. That's the story of the Tower of Babel. And then in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, probably more familiar to most folks than the other ones that I just now read, even though Genesis is a very familiar book to many. But Isaiah 6 and verse 8, the word of God says, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who will go for us? Uh, the, then said I, Here am I, send me. So we have here God speaking in the plural. Very important for us to remember this. And by the way, the New Testament also declares his trinity. And when Jesus was baptized, you have your Bibles, you might want to go to these. Uh, we're going to go to Matthew, 2 Corinthians, and John. The Bible says in Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. It was not a dove. It says like a dove. And so, and your Bible should have a capital S on spirit. And it says, and he saw the spirit of God descending as a dove, like a dove, 
and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We find three facts in these two verses. Number one, the Father speaks. Number two, the Son is baptized. And number three, we find the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. To deny this is Trinity is to deny straight Bible teaching. Number two under that, in the baptism formula itself, the Bible says in Matthew 28 and verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So there you have all three. Now, it's, it's a formula, but it's not a rule. The name of is speaking of by the authority of, by the authority of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The oneness Pentecostals say you're not baptized if you're not baptized only in Jesus' name. Well, that's a total misunderstanding of what the word of God is teaching. When it says, uh, uh, I think about in Acts where they, they forbid the apostles from preaching in the name of Jesus. They are, they, they're not talking here about not saying Jesus. They're talking about by his authority. Same thing true here, baptizing by the authority of the Trinity. And then, of course, in the apostles' prayers, it's proven. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So there you have all three mentioned again in the very teachings of Jesus himself. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17 he said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, and that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. And your Bible should have a capital S again on the word Spirit, speaking, referring to the Holy Spirit. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So there we have what the Father is going to give. A, a very amazing how the word of God is so clear on the teaching of the Trinity. And then uh, in the fact that all three are referred to as God. This is interesting. In Romans 1 in verse 7, the Bible says to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 9 and verse 5, who are the, uh, whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God be blessed forever. Amen. And then Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. But unto the Son, he saith, capital S, thy throne, O God. That's interesting. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness uh, is the scepter of thy kingdom. And then in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. The word of God says, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Thou hast conceived this thing in thine heart. Thou hast lied not unto men, but unto God. So here we have the members of the Trinity referred to as God throughout Scripture. So we must understand that this is what the Word of God teaches. There are three, well, we'll get to that in just a moment. The, number three, the Trinity is involved in our salvation. The Trinity is involved in our salvation. First of all, the Father is involved, John six thirty seven. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. The Son is involved in our salvation. John 12 and verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So we have the Father involved in our salvation and the Son involved in our salvation. Uh, the Calvinists are unusual in this area. They say that nobody gets saved unless God draws them. I love John 12. He simply says, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw them into me. So that just takes care of that false doctrine right there, doesn't it? But then the Holy Spirit's involved in our salvation as well. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. The Bible says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things uh, after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise to the praise uh, of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, 
uh, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, capital S on the Spirit, uh, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. We have all three members of the Trinity mentioned in our salvation, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How can we possibly deny the clear teachings of the Trinity in the Word of God? And by the way, number four, the Trinity is involved in our eternal security. In our eternal security. Yeah, once saved, always saved. Uh, God says uh, that you're saved, and that's good enough for me. God said it, and that settles it. That's all there is to it. But the Trinity is involved in our eternal security Look what the word of God says. The Father and the Son in John 10, 28 through 30. It says, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Jesus is speaking here. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And then he goes on to say, I and my Father are one. Verse 30. He's saying, me and my Father agree on this. You're in my hand, the Father's hand, all together. And then we find out the Holy Spirit. And this is not the only verse, but it's the one I'm going to use. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. The Bible says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's no wonder Peter wrote and said we're kept by the power of God. It's no wonder he said we're kept by that wonderful power. And Jesus holds me, the Father holds Jesus, and the Holy Spirit seals me in. <laughs> to me, that's good, and I like that. Number five, is there a scriptural proof text for the, for the Trinity? Well, if what we've given so far was not enough, yes, there is. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, and this is where you're going to look a little bit at the paper that I handed out to you earlier. Uh, the Bible says this in 1 John 5, beginning in verse 6, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit, capital S, that beareth witness, because the Spirit, capital S, is truth. Uh, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. God said it, and that simply settles it. In our study last week on what we believe about the Word of God, we found that 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 is partially included in some modern translations. However, to exclude part of this verse is not only improper theology, it is also improper Greek. Therefore, the inclusion of the entire verse is not only proper theology, it is proper Greek. Very interesting. What he's talking about here, I'm going to give you the name of it, and you're welcome to look it up. It's called the Johannian Comma. There's more proof to prove that it's part of Scripture than it is to say that there's not. <clears throat> in your Schofield Reference Bible, there is a little note there by, by 1 John 5 and verse 7. In fact, I'm going to go there right now in my Bible, and I'm going to read you what Mr. Schofield erroneously said. And he's messed up a lot of people by saying this. And 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 and it says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And if you were to go to the little letter O in the middle of, your, of the reference column there, it says, it is generally agreed that verse 7 has no real authority and has been inserted. Excuse me, Mr. Schofield? You're telling me that my Bible is not trustworthy? You're telling me that my Bible, I can't trust what it says. Is that what you're saying? You remember what I promised you last Wednesday night? You're never going to hear me say it's better stated this way or the Bible is inaccurate in this or this is a mistranslation. You're never going to hear me say it. Mr. Schofield has caused great damage in Christianity by saying it has no authority. 
He says it's not found in the oldest and the best manuscripts. What are those oldest and best manuscripts he's talking about? He's talking about the Vaticanus, for one. In the Vaticanus, it was a Greek text that was found literally in a trash can. They had thrown it away because it was so untrustworthy. Now, that is an oversimplification of an absolute truth. They found it thrown away. I saw a facsimile of the, of the Vaticanus from the Vatican, uh, the Vat and that word was one of our words in our calendar, Brother Penn, on being, uh, the Vatican being a spokesman, one that speaks, a word that is spoken. And uh, I saw a facsimile of the pages. They have scriptures, the Greek text, completely blotted out and written in the margins. And I think that's an amazing. When did a man have the authority to scratch out the word of God? And I saw this with my own eyes. I'm not making this up, and you're welcome to do the same research. Now, here's something interesting. So, the King James states this, and you have it in your notes there, that page that I handed out. For there are, in 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, I want you to notice with me how it's rendered in other versions, and I did the study on myself. First of all, in the ESV, the English Standard Version. The ESV has become the most popular Bible in modern Christianity. It is used by more churches and by more Christians around the world. I believe it's even surpassed the NIV. And here's what it says in the ESV. For there are three that testify. And then in the NIV, the New International Version, it says, for there are three that testify. And then in the Revised Standard Version, it says, and the Spirit is the witness because the Spirit is the truth. And then the new Revised Standard Version says, there are three that testify. And then in the New American Standard Bible, it says, and it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is the truth. Now here's the shocker. The New World Translation, which is the Bible of the Jehovah's Witnesses, it says, for there are three witness bearers. I find it interesting. All these other versions agree with the Jehovah's Witness. Now, if I got up and preached out of a Jehovah's Witness Bible, there would be a meeting, and I would not be invited until after something was settled. I, th I find it interesting, and by the way, on that sheet that you have that I passed out, I have included the ESV on every verse that I, that I have listed for you. And every one of those verses agrees with the New World Translation. To me, that says a great deal about what manuscript it came from. It's not trustworthy. You see, in the Greek manuscripts, if I may boil a lot of fat off of this, there is a Byzantine text and there is an Alexandrian text. Byzantine is the one that God has used, and the Alexandrian text is the one that every, all those other Bibles come from. They don't agree with one another. Alexandrian, that's Alexandria, Egypt. The, they say, well, pastor, are there any, are there any um, Byzantine texts left? I saw a part of one one time. It was about this big. And the reason there wasn't anything left is because it was used up. But the other texts were intact. And that's why people like Mr. Schofield and others say the oldest and the best manuscripts are these. It's because they're still in good shape. I've given this illustration before. Before you started using your phone and your computer, everybody got two phone books every year, a yellow one and a black one. At least it was here in Colorado Springs. The yellow one is the one you used, and that's the one that was all tore up and had pages ripped and things marked in it. The black one was used to put your grandkids on during supper. Why? Because it wasn't complete. It wasn't the good one. And the same thing's true with the Vaticanus or, and, and uh, the Sinaiticus and uh, the Byzantine or Alexandrian, whatever you want to call those. It's because one was used up and one was not used at all. And so it's obvious that the doctrine of the Trinity is affected by these other versions. You say, well, it's taught other places, but it's denied here. And it needs to be included here because that's proper. And because it is right. 
This doctrine concerning God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is a cornerstone doctrine of our Christian faith. When God said, let us make man in our likeness in Genesis 1.26, he was referring to the Trinity of himself. In the Christianity of today, there are those who do not hold to the doctrine of the Trinity. Many believe, as do the oneness Pentecostals as Jesus, in Jesus only, that heresy, as do the uh, and other groups. And to believe that there is no Trinity is to deny rudimentary elementary Bible teaching. I don't know any other way to put it. In other words, in its simplest form. That's like looking at an alphabet saying A doesn't exist because it's so clearly taught in the Bible. The doctrine of the Trinity begins in Genesis 1 and verse 1, not in 1700s. In the beginning Elohim, singular plural, bunch of bananas, barrel of apples, one God, three persons. And it continues from there. And without the Trinity, you could not have salvation. Man sinned against the holy God. And that sin separated him from God and drew the penalty of sin, which is death in hell. And the Son was sent to die in our place and, and pay sin's penalty so that we could have the gift of eternal life. And when we get saved, then we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Because after we receive that wonderful gift, that Holy Spirit of God seals us. He signs the contract. He's the earnest of our salvation, you see, that guarantee. And we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of his purchased possession is taken care of. And so that's why we believe in what we believe about the Trinity. And uh, oh, books have been written, volumes have been written. This is not a volume. It's not even a long Bible study. The truth of the matter is, it's one of those things that we need to be clear on. When I got saved, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. I learned that out of the Word of God. And the Spirit of God wrote the Bible. And then the Bible says, once I trusted Christ as my Savior, the Holy Spirit of God sealed me. Being confident, by the way, of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And how important that is. Now, we'll be looking at that little sheet that I handed out to you. You better have, and you folks that are listening online, you better have a trustworthy Bible. And if you out there in, in Facebook land have a pastor that's always correcting the Bible, I think you need to find somebody that believes the Bible rather than doesn't believe it. And I mean that with all my heart. And because now in Christianity, there's a version for any day of the week. Did you know there was even a street language Bible at one time? Yeah. Used terrible street language. How many remember, oh, what was the green padded one called? Good news for modern man. Do you know they had to revise that because of the curse words that were in it, that were used as curse words? Very amazing. And uh, it's just, to me, if we don't have a trustworthy Bible, we need to get one. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And then it says, out of the mouth of the Lord. We need to make sure we have an every word Bible, because if we're not careful, we're going to start denying this book. And when we have teaching that is as clear as the teaching of the Trinity, we need to make sure we have a Bible that includes that teaching. That little list of verses that I gave you a little bit ago, that all leave out the teaching of the Trinity. Beware of those perversions, and yes, I call them perversions. Shall we stand?